This is Precision Stuff, and today we're going to be talking about motor shaft sizing. Let's consider a shaft. It has a length, L, and a diameter, D. It has two bearings on it. They are radial bearings, which means they can take radial loads, but they don't really take moment loads or axial loads. And what we're going to do is load up this shaft in a few different ways. So we'll give us our coordinate system, X and Z, and out of the plane, Y. We will put an axial load, FX, and that just represents you know, someone tugging on the shaft. Um, it'll be spinning and is probably transferring a torque. Put that there as a torque that is in the X axis. And then usually when you have a shaft that's spinning, you might have a bearing or uh, you might have like a gear or a pump or a pulley or a belt, and that is probably putting some sort of side load. Call that FZ. And then if you're unlucky, you might also be contributing a twisting moment. That would be MY twisting on the end of the shaft. And so what we want to do here is figure out how do these loads move through the shaft and the bearings, what stresses do they create, what points in the shaft have the highest stress, and basically when will this fail. So we're going to go through this step by step. Let's first look at the torque. So the torque or torsion going through the beam. Let's say, you know, there's a motor, here's like the motor rotor, it's creating the actual torque, which then comes out the end. Essentially, we can say that that torque, T, exists essentially everywhere in the shaft, although gets taken out where the motor is. So the back of the shaft does not see any torque. So this is you know, Newton meters versus X. This is the front of the shaft. And essentially everywhere in this front section, the uh, torque is constant. Cool. What does that do? Well, in the shaft cross section, looking down, the torque creates a shear stress distribution. And the shear stress distribution looks like a triangle. Triangles are my favorite shape. The outermost bits of the shaft are twisting the most. They have the most deformation. Therefore, they have the most shear stress. Cool. And that shear stress is equal to torque times R over the polar moment, JT. We'll walk through that in a second. You could evaluate the shear stress anywhere, but it's going to be highest at the surface, which is why that is R. Cool. So everywhere along this outside of this region, you have the maximum shear stress due to torque. Now we're going to go through bending. And now this bending is caused both by FZ and also MY. So what I'm going to do first is draw the shear diagram. So this is shear force as a function of x. And at that moment where I put in fz, I'm getting you know, a shear of fz. And that shear lasts until I hit a reaction force from the bearings. Now, without going into too much detail, there basically is a reaction force, r1 and r2, from the bearings. If you'd like to know what the magnitude is, I worked it out previously. It is minus F times L1 plus L2 over L2 minus M over L2. Essentially, the front bearing is taking a rather large load in the opposite direction of the applied load. And then the back bearing is actually taking less, F times L1 over L2 plus M over L2. You'll notice that these have to be equal and opposite. If you put in a moment, one pushes up, one pushes down to resist that moment. And the further the bearings are spaced out, the better. L1 is the distance from the first bearing to the end of the shaft, and L2 is from bearing to bearing. Broadly speaking, if you're designing a good motor, your L1 will be shorter than L2, so you don't have crazy massive loads in your bearings. So if we're looking at the shear, if we just consider the effect of Fz, which is you know this component, We'll find that we move along, we hit that reaction force, that reaction force pushes us to negative, we're going down by R1, but it's still a less shear absolute than FZ. And then we go across and we bump back up by R2, and then we get back to zero shear at the end of the bearing. If we start to look at the moment, well, now we need to draw the moment diagram. So this moment diagram is telling us, as a function of x, the newton meters or moment in the shaft in bending and essentially a force at a distance means that inside that shaft there is a you know stress contribution that creates a moment so 
this moment here creates reaction forces, but doesn't actually show up as a shear right away. We get a little extra, you know, set of shear from those moments being applied. But when you go to the moment diagram, the story gets a little bit different. So we'll start at zero, because at the end of the shaft, we'll just go up and then go back down. And if we're just looking at the contribution of Fz, that peak moment would be Fz times R1, because that's a force times the distance, L1, sorry. However, the moment appears immediately. That moment M shows up right away, and it's constant until it hits that reaction, and then it starts to trail off as well. If you put all of these together, you'll get the following. So the total moment in the beam shaft, same thing, is going to be looking like this. It starts jumping up to m. It ends up at m plus fz times l1, and then it tapers down to zero. So we know that the maximum moment occurs right there at the point of load application, R1, which is right underneath the bearing, right there. And when we look at the distribution of stresses inside the beam, this is you know looking sideways at the shaft, what a moment does is it creates a linear stress distribution like this. And what you'll find is that there's basically no stress in the middle of the shaft, but the outer surfaces are stressed highly at the top or the bottom, sometimes tension, sometimes compression. So what we're expecting is the highest stresses will be at that point at the outer surface because sigma bend is equal to my over i, which in this case, that's the moment as a function of x times y, the distance from the neutral axis, which is just r over i. We're gonna go over that in a second. Cool. Now let's look at an axial load. Practically, the axial loads are going to be small because they get taken up by the entire area that are well distributed. But let's just double check that axial. Depending on how you design, this is a basically force over distance. Depending on how you design your motor and shaft and setups, you could choose the axial load to come out out of one bearing or two bearings or you know, whatever you want. Practically, it's easiest to take the axial load out of this bearing and let the back one float. Like literally, you can move back and forth, it's not taking any axial load, and you probably have to put in some sort of collar or shaft coupling right there to basically transfer that axial load into the bearing, and you might press fit the bearing up against that. So the axial load can be found in this region. And that is basically Fx. It doesn't exist past that point because it's all taken out in the first bearing, so the back half of the shaft basically is completely unloaded. And the axial stress is equal to sigma axial equals force over area. Cool, so we have a few geometry factors we need to pull out. We need to find the polar moment, we need to find the eye, we need to find the area. Now we need to put it all together and find the location of maximum stress. Let's do our geometry first. Cool, so the area of a circle is pi r squared. The i, the second moment of inertia of that shaft is equal to pi by four r to the four. And the polar moment is pi by two r to the four. Interesting, we'll get to that in a second. Cool, so if we're going through the stresses, we find out that the, the shear is torque times r over pi by two r to the four. That is two over pi times torque over r cubed. That's a really big deal. If you make your shaft 10% larger in diameter, your shear stresses go down by 30%. Pretty good bang for the buck. Now we do bending. Sigma bend is equal to, we get the m times r, and we're gonna use the maximum m, which occurs right there, times r, because it's the outside surface, over pi by four r to the four. We do the similar rearrangements. Sigma bend is equal to, 4 over pi times m over r cubed. It's really important to realize that both the bending stresses and the torsional shear stresses both scale as 1 over r cubed. They're very sensitive to shaft diameter. You might also think, hey, for a single newton meter of bending moment, I'm getting twice as much stress as a single newton meter of torque. 
not quite true, because we're going to get to the von Mises stress in a second, and essentially this shear gets multiplied by a root 3. So you end up comparing 4 is about the same as 2 root 3, because that's about 3.4. And what you'll find is actually, even though they end up producing similar amounts of stresses statically, the bending stresses are alternating top and bottom, while the shear is not, and that's going to provide a huge fatigue load, which will kill the shaft eventually. Cool, but we're not quite there yet. Sigma axial. I told you it's going to be small, because it's fx over pi r squared equals, you know, 1 over pi fx over r squared. And that r squared term, you might think, well, you know, cube is bigger than square. That should be better, right? Well, we're talking about distances that are a small fraction of a meter. Maybe the shaft is 0.01 meters. So small number squared is bigger than small number cubed. It, you, know, you don't want to be a small number less than one if you're getting squared and cubed. It, it hurts. Cool. So putting this all together, we need to figure out how all these shears and forces and stresses turn into one point of failure in the shaft. So we zoom in to the shaft. And we're going to look right underneath the bearing at that cross section. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on a little tiny cubic element of the shaft. And we're going to basically ask it what's going on. So we'll find from shear, from torsion, we basically have a shear load on that surface. Awesome. And the bending, well, let's see. If I'm pushing up and I'm twisting this way, the top of that shaft is being compressed. I should have a basically negative bending stress. Sigma bend. However, I'm also pulling on that shaft axially. I could be pushing, but right now fx positive is pulling. So I have a sigma axial going the other direction. And if I looked at the bottom of the shaft, it's basically the same story. I could draw another little volume. The shear is going the opposite direction, which doesn't really matter. The, but now the bending and the axial stresses are lining up in the same direction. So if you're using a ductile material, like aluminum or steel, like a typical metal, you're going to want to use a von Mises stress criterion to predict failure. If you had a brittle material, like a you know, ceramic or something, or a stone, you might use a maximum uh, principal stress condition. So sigma von Mises is equal to, in this case, your bending stress plus your axial stress squared plus three times your shear stress squared. That's where the three comes from when I was comparing it up here. And that's basically saying, you know, shear stresses kill materials faster than axial stresses. So you can walk through from the forces to the geometry to the point of maximum load. You can pull out all these stresses find the von Mises stress. If you were looking for a static load condition, you'd set this to be comfortably less than the yield strength, and you'd probably be fine. However, this is not a static application. That shaft is spinning, which means the little piece of volume that starts on the top ends up at the bottom, and then back at the top, and then back at the bottom, and maybe it switches places millions or billions of times because it's rapidly rotating. So what happens is that piece of material goes through multiple different stress states. And what you might think kind of naively as well, the von Mises stress is always positive. It's, you know, it's a square root of sum of squares. It's really hard to get a negative number out of a square root of sum of squares. So you might think that, oh, well, you know, the bending and the axial, they're slightly fighting each other on the bottom, on the top, but they're, they're working together on the bottom. So you might think there's like, you kind of small ripples of stress as you rotate. But practically, the bending is actually going from compression to tension. And so you have to look at um, the median and the alternating stresses and you'll find out that, wow, actually the stress is going from basically mostly in compression to you know, mostly in tension, mostly in compression, and back and forth. You might even have fully reverse stresses, where if the shear stresses are low, you're basically getting yanked back and forth, tension, compression, tension, compression. That is really brutal on the fatigue life, and that is called R equals 1, fully reversed. If you had a you know, pretty high median stress and a small alternating stress, that R would be less, and that affects your fatigue life. So... Let's say you are a busy engineer and this shaft had to be released yesterday because you're running out of time. What would you do? You'd calculate this von Mises stress. <laughs> You'd assume it's fully reversed. You'd find um, a SN curve, which is basically stress versus cycle life. And full, for a fully reversed case, you'd probably throw in a factor of safety of three to cover stress concentrations because that shaft right there at that bearing, let's say here's your bearing, it's kind of a little bit rounded, but not really that much. Your shaft is probably going to have a pretty sharp fillet there and a shoulder to push up against the bearing. That's the point that's going to fail 
because that's a pretty sharp stress concentration change in geometry, easily you get 3x locally more stress there than you would, you know, a millimeter away. Then you might derate for temperature, like, hey, this is a motor, it gets hot, it goes to 200 Celsius. If you're at aluminum, you might only have, you know, 40, 50, 60% of your strength left. If you're a steel, maybe only you drop by 10%, it's not a big deal. So you might derate for temperature, you will derate for a stress concentration, you might even add in some details for corrosion if this is going to be a corrosive environment. And then you'd go look at your um, stress life curve and you'd figured out, you know, how big does the shaft need to be such that the stress is low enough such that I get the life that I want. And you might throw a generic factor of safety of like one and a half or two just to cover things. That means you can get the shaft out the door, you get it made, it'll probably work, it's probably oversized and you move on. If you had more time, what you would do is you'd actually figure out the alternating and median components of the uh, von Mises force, von Mises stress. You then actually account for the stress concentration factors are different for bending axial and shear loads. You'd cover all that. Then you'd go find the exact ratio of alternating and median stresses. You'd go pull out a better SN curve. You'd do more detailed analysis on that. You might even um, do fracture analysis and figure out if I'm polishing this shaft, I expect the kind of initial crack sizes to be this long. And if I have this alternating stress, I expect cracks to grow at this rate due to Paris's equation. And then you'd figure out how long it can go before it'll enter fast fracture. Or you could say, well, the motor spends some of its time at low stress, some of its time at high stress, and you could count those differently. There's a lot more analysis you could do. And then you'd get to a higher level of confidence, but you'd also ship your product later and maybe you'd get surprised by something. There's one last thing to mention, which is both in bending and in torsion, the middle of the beam is not doing that much work. So that shaft, you know, the neutral axis is not getting stretched. The middle of the shaft is not getting twisted. So you're paid for material to sit there. It costs mass, it costs money, but it's not taking any load. The point that's going to fail is this little piece right here under the bearing, but you paid for all that shaft to be everywhere, even though it's not highly loaded. So what can you do? You might want to consider a hollow shaft. If you have a hollow shaft, then you know, you're still twisting the whole axis and you still get shear forces and shear stresses. But now they actually look kind of more evenly distributed because you cut away that middle that's not doing anything. And in terms of bending as well, if you look at the bending stresses, you'll find that those are also more evenly distributed because you took away the material that was poorly stressed. So in general, if you're going for mass efficiency or cost efficiency, you might consider a hollow tube because it gives you a better use of material. However, sometimes it's actually more expensive to remove the material than to keep it there. If you're buying solid shafts and you need to pay someone to drill a hole in it, that's an extra lathe operation. That's gonna cost you money. However, if you're buying tubes, maybe you can get that away for free. Either way, if you're trying to save mass or you're at very high volumes and material cost matters, then it might be worthwhile to consider a thin wall tube. However, you could take this to the extreme and you could have a giant soda can shaft where it's like you know, aluminum foil and it's a huge diameter and all these metrics would look fabulous. The only problem is that it's going to wrinkle, it's going to buckle, it's going to do things that have elastic stability concerns that this stress analysis does not cover. This is purely a you know, deformation and stress analysis, it doesn't cover any of those buckling phenomena. So you always have to be wary about, you know, this equation is correct, it's describing something, but that doesn't mean it is fully telling you how this will fail. However, if you have a pretty stubby, uh, thick wall tube, you know, let's say this is 12 millimeters and this is maybe a three or four or five millimeter thick wall, you're probably not gonna wrinkle that or run into any other issues. So this is how you'd size stress analysis for a motor shaft. Of course, there's always more you can do, there's always, you know, <laughs> more analysis that can be done, but sometimes it is best to chase good enough today rather than perfect tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed that. Please consider subscribing. This is more precision stuff. Thank you.